Okay. Um, questions from the, open to the floor now. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Um, for Mr. Fontenot, uh, I'm Kinthia Mulathori, I'm at uh, EPFL. So my question is about your stance on um, using 50% of the daily towers as a goal. And why, I understand why you, you want to separate the goal of daylight from energy, because it's, it's a sort of um, compromise, if you do it like that. But what's the point in having, for example, I don't know, a school where, you know, it, there is no one. There is, the light is perfect, but it's after, you know, everyone has left the building. That's it. Yeah. Uh, it's, I don't know which microphone works. Uh, one, two? Yes. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, this has been, of course, a debate within the experts. Uh, we are proposing a standard for the space, a daily space. Uh, what we have done, we have conducted different case studies to check the consequences of that, if it makes sense. Of course, in the case study analysis, we check that the, uh, the consequence of applying such a standard will be good, reasonable, going in the good direction, right? So this 50% doesn't mean that in reality, you do 50% economy or whatever, because the schedules of operation would be different. But the building would be built, its life may be 60 years, one century, two centuries, and it will provide daylight over the life, like this, you know? Uh, so the, uh, this 50% and the 300 lux was actually coming from C uh, earlier uh, uh, CA publication from the 70s, I think, and from observation, and. Uh, also, one as important aspect is that the same approach was uh, taken in the United States, and uh, I think it was a good idea also to, to be sure what, that we have a little bit of coherence between what we're doing, so we are not uh, going to another transatlantic uh, battle. But I would say, I think that Jim and certainly our opinion about the strategy used in North America compared to what we're doing. Um, Paul, would you like to add any comment on the sort of minimum target you're aiming to push for the building regulations? Yeah, I think I, I like to say what, um, what the certification we, work, we often are faced with is where the rubber meets the road and um, it, the ideas that are produced here as to good daylight, there's a lot of focus on good daylight mm -hmm. and yes, we need that kind of work. Ambition is important but the fact of the matter, there's a lot of buildings that we have that don't that have very restricted daylight by default. Mm. And what do we do in those cases? What, what's the best metric there? I don't, I don't know. Um, but we have to be very careful in assuming that it's as important to the industry in general as it is to us. Okay. Um. <laughs> Who's got the mic? Thanks, Mark. Uh, this is a comment, a question for you. Uh, so I'm happy that there's some uh, debate between uh, North America and okay. Europe because I think there's a big advantage of having similar uh, metrics on both sides. I think on our end, uh, even though it took the committee there, Marilyn was on there, and a few of us, uh, seven years to get to that uh, in the US, a big part was really the study that was led by Lisa Hachon on the 65 spaces because these were not shoeboxes but real spaces. And uh, then we had this follow-up work where we looked with 13 schools of architecture at, again, real spaces and have an evaluation of that. Are you planning to do something like this? Because that seems to convince designers most that if we ask people what they think where the daylight area is, and then that's what the point of the simulation is, right? We want to mimic what people are going to say about the space. Um, yeah, thank Christoph for uh, your comments. Uh, first, uh, I've been personally involved in a campaign of field measurements in Denmark with a panel of professionals and architects to assess, 
if the space looks well lit and at the same time we're doing measurements. So we have pretty good uh, data on that for the minimum, the importance of the minimum daylight factor in the room and also of the median daylight factor, which is far more important than the average daylight factor, which unfortunately tends to mix uh, daylight next to the window, which is abundant to the rest, and this introduces an error. What I wanted just to ask, I didn't have much time to explain that, but this, we have proposed, uh, this performance can be achieved by climate-based modeling or whatever, right? But also with daylight factor. So we have prepared tables of daylight factor values for 33 cities in Europe to allow simple achievement of the targets of this. So there are two routes which are proposed. Okay, I've got a question here. Um, Paul. Paul, Paul Littlefair, BRE. Is there, is there going to be a difference in the standard between different types of spaces? Because obviously something that, that might be desirable in an office might be very difficult to achieve in a dwelling. Yeah, we actually, we, um, we looked at the BRE uh, requirements for dwellings that had the, because we're, we're pretty sure that bedrooms don't need as much as a, a living room. And that also, by doing that, you give some flexibility to the designer, by give, as opposed to say a blanket requirement for every room. The fact that you may, okay, maybe you can move the pieces around a little bit to, to accommodate the code. Um, that I think is very important. Now, just exactly who decides, the problem I think we have is, in particular, kitchens. And I know BRE wanted a 2% kitchen uh, for average daylight factor, but we're, we're finding that it's a common solution to bring the kitchen back to the core of the building. To, it's very efficient. You know, we put it next to the mm -hmm. bathroom, and, and uh, a lot of people don't get home till after 6 or 7 o'clock anyways to make dinner. Um, so to leave, do you want a window in your kitchen or not, up to a commercial choice. Mm. So just exactly how there's some people that f will fight for that right for their kitchen window, but maybe that's it's a commercial. So there's some issues with that and, and how we have open and closed or open and, and, and cellular offices. But that I think could be one of the things that really saves us is a, a, a different thresholds for different types of spaces. Yeah. Just, to add, just to add something, Paul, is the, uh, we define what is a daily space, whether the kitchen, the bathroom should be delete is actually away from our standard, right? We are not discussing that. We're not into regulation. We're into uh, promoting a minimum quantity of delight to say this is a delete space. So we restricted this to avoid this type of debate. Because I can tell you, if we had to define minimum delight factors in kitchen over Europe, uh, we have another, you know, 50 years of discussion ahead, right? Yeah. I think it's, it's pretty good. It's whoever, if it's developers or estate agents are trying to sell that they have a daylight kitchen, it's up to them to define it. Yeah. Okay, uh, I think what another question is there? My question is to Ellen. Uh, I, I find your work very interesting with English history. And I was thinking, uh, all this data we've pre been presented uh, yesterday and today, uh, is it possible that we can... Um, my question is, can, is it possible that the street width you're talking about the street width and uh, also the, the, the glass area and the facades. Is it possible to, to create standards which is very simple to apply, to, to, uh, to uh, operationalize, uh, or you can say, make active, uh, in, and disregard data a little bit more? Yeah, it, it's very difficult. I, mean, I think I, I really like the analogy that um, yeah, the doctor will first say, is the patient alive or dead? And I think standards sort of operate at that level. They're very crude, but at the same time, perhaps they're sort of necessary in terms of... It, the, the origins of my particular research came from doing a study of older people's housing, which showed that actually in about half of the schemes I visited, the minimum daylight factor standards were not complied with. And these are relatively simple metrics. It should be fairly simple for architects to be able to, to use this. And so it, I think it is, it's a very difficult one. How, how simple do you have to go before you, have, you can produce something that actually you can reasonably expect people to, to actually comply with, that you can actually expect um, to, you know, people to be held to account to? So for example, where you have local authorities not necessarily checking whether the, the buildings comply with these regulations, um, I mean, that's because you haven't necessarily got people in the local authorities uh, with the right kind of skills um, to be able to actually check it. 
Um, so I think maybe there is a bit of a trade-off of maybe sometimes the metrics we should be using are actually you know, the, the better ones for these kinds of standards are the ones that are very, very simple. And even the, you know, though it becomes a very crude measure, at least it sort of lifts that kind of bottom end out of you know, where, it, where it is certainly in the UK at the moment. Any other questions from the floor? Um, yeah, I'm observing, obviously, but um, uh, the Pantheon has been mentioned uh, several times during yesterday and today. And um, I'm not sure if the Pantheon is rebuilt again, if it uh, fulfills any uh, standards um, just now in this world. So my question is, sometimes we need more intelligent architecture or creative architecture instead of um, standards. Um, can you comment on that? Yeah, um, the uh, Stockholm Library that was presented earlier today uh, would not pass the Swedish code, not even close. Um, but then I'd, the way the Swedish code works is you can often, I think, show due cause why there is what they call um, common sense at a certain level. And I think that always has to be there. The code can't be just applied, you should be able to apply for a, a dispensation under certain circumstances. And uh, like, it would be great to look at all of our Altos buildings, who's synonymous with good daylight, and apply the different codes and see how they go. Um, we, need, we, need, we need common sense, otherwise it, it doesn't work. Those standards are good, but not necessarily... Well, I think when you have... When you have a, an apartment that's you know got a balcony under it and a balcony over over the the very small window and eight stories all around and common sense and the code will say that's not good enough and you can defend the code there. Yeah, I mean I enjoy your your comment. The when we worked on the standard, we clearly wanted to avoid. Uh, too many bad uh, or poorly delete buildings. That was the issue. Uh, we don't want to, uh, it has nothing to do with genius or not acknowledging uh, clever architects or whatever. Uh, we know that uh, we promote delight because there's a lot of, unfortunately, uh, problems of buildings which are poorly lit with delight, right? But uh, hopefully uh, they are, uh, this is not a one condition, but it's not an indispensable condition. We're not into regulation again. We're into providing something so the industry, the professionals, different people can talk about. And if, as a future client, you say, I want a very delete building, this could help. Right, it could help to talk about it. Instead of just, I want a delete building, point, do it. <laughs> I just wanted to make one comment, observation as well, with all the, among all the questions that was asked earlier. I think in the end, I mean, the standards really, really help when sort of someone have a building to design with, to decide how big the windows need to be, etc. But when we are really talking about daylight strategies, setting it at a planning, urban planning level, some of these sort of what's came up before, um, like the BRS protractor, is something that we can take away and learn, because in the end, if you start building cities, really of high density, tall buildings, very close together. Doesn't matter how big the window is, you just won't get the right daylight. So at least at a level, the city scale level, we need to get that right. And there could be something very, very simple, how much sky you can see, the 30 degrees or, or more, is something the planners could set and adopt by different cities. And then after that, there will be a chance to at, at least achieve a minimum um, daylight factors or daylight autonomy or UDI in, within a building. And it's a set of tools. Stand is always useful as a safety, safety net for poor design. And hopefully, among here, we should be able to sort of guide and steer of what's really the right approach. And at this point, I, I really, I'd like to wrap up this panel session and pass, pass it back to Jim to do a closing uh, remarks on it all. And well, uh, thank you for yeah. our panelists and thank speakers. Thank you, panelists. Yeah. Thank you, and um, appreciation, please.